Good evening. Welcome to our June 2023 committee meetings. We're going to begin with our athletic agenda, which will be chaired by Mr. LaQuinn Thompson. Good evening, everyone. Um, all, all board members are present, except for uh, Director uh, Glover Brown. Uh, we have some items up for discussion. Um, first one, 2A, small fields update. That would be me, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> We're starting off with uh, this small field update. As anyone has noticed, we uh, last week the we're doing a stormwater survey and permit for the field at Smalls uh, in the outfields of the baseball baseball diamond. There's no firm date on when they'll be starting that yet. What we do know is they they will put a plan, and I'm sorry. When we do know, we will put a plan in place and get information out to not only the board but to our coaches and staff as to how we will proceed down there with practice and who can practice, who can't. If we have to move games for uh, baseball and softball next spring, we'll have to figure out what fields we can go to in order to play those games. But for right now, uh, that information is, is pending and, and forthcoming. The weight room. Uh, for flooring, we've had, um, they discovered termites in the flooring, in the floor. So, but, I, but that has been treated. And now we can move on with uh, the rubberized flooring, which we had to get three quotes for, for the board. And we do have three quotes. So that we'll be forwarding that information to the board, the three quotes that we received, that, so we can put the flooring down. But the termite situation has been rectified. And it's, it's being sealed, and and the uh, rubberized coating that sticks the rubber on the floor will be next. But then we can go, uh, go on forth for the rubber rubber coating for the floor, so we can actually lift weights in there. I'm not going to speak about the gym floor resurfacing for right now. I'm going to skip that. We're going to shelve that for now. Um, it's something we'll think of, we'll look at later on, maybe next year. Um, the sound system, all speakers will be replaced in the gym at the high school, and it should be completed by the end of summer. The uh, sound system, as anybody who went to our basketball games this past winter, it was cracking and it wasn't clear and, and the sound was not very good at all. So well, we were able to upgrade those and hopefully be done by the end of the summer. <clears throat> summer workouts, football has already started and we'll continue into July for summer workouts. They had a, um, uh, a, a what I want to call it, like an open field combine. Yes, thank you. A combine just past, uh, two weeks ago, and about 30 of our kids were there. And St. Francis was running it, but using our facility and using our, and our players. And obviously, some other players from other teams could come in and, and get looked at. And for my understanding, it went very, very well. Like I said, 30 of our kids of the probably 70 kids or so were that were there. Um, a couple of our kids I heard got offers uh, from that combine. That's all good stuff. Yes, one of ours, yes, one of ours definitely did. Um, we have another young man, now Mike McGonagall, who's our lineman. He's, he's getting some real good offers from, from big division one schools. I think he just came back from Duke University. Um, I, some offers were coming to my office, some letters, I should say, from Iowa State and other schools that are looking at him. So that's all good stuff for our football, for our football team and our kids. Uh, soccer will be starting workouts. They'll be doing two, two days a week up until the season starts. So that'll be girls and boys soccer. They'll, they'll practice together in the beginning of the season to get their kids in shape. Uh, down at Smalls Field until the season starts, and then we'll obviously be going full force in August. Girls Volleyball has started in April, open gym, that is. Um, she usually brings up the eighth graders who are going to be ninth graders who want to try out for the team, and as well as some of the girls that are back from the, other, from the previous season. So she brings them all together and has open workouts in, in the, uh, up at uh, 
York High School. And then she has stopped right now, but then she'll be continuing. She'll start up again in July to do her preseason workouts. That's all I have for this evening. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Not a question, just a comment. I did attend the sports banquet and it was very crowded. Yes. I enjoyed <laughs> I definitely enjoyed it. <laughs> and I just wanted to say job well done. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot more people came than I expected, that's for sure. <laughs> but it all worked out. Thanks. And I want to give a quick shout out to the Elks for letting us use their place for that occasion. Uh, yes, I was kind of happy that it was overcrowded. <laughs> We we'll have to find a place else to go next year. So, but thank you very much. And thank you again. Thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, Superintendent, uh, Dr. Barry, do you have any? Uh... No, sir. All right. Thank you. Uh, President Breeden, that concludes the report. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. At this time, we'll move to buildings and grounds agenda. Ms. Liggins. Good evening, board directors, administration, all that are listening. Um, all board members are present except for one. I'm going to call on Sean at this time, Mr. Haynes, to give an update on some of our items. Uh, yes, good evening, uh, directors. Um, we have on the agenda the uh, proposed approval of the switchgear replacement for the administration building. Uh, we did uh, reach out to several minority contractors. Um, H.B. McClure was uh, one, one of the best quotes that came in. And I do have Mr. Muldrow and Mr. Preston here if there are any technical questions about the switch gear. Um, and then just an overall picture what that is for is we were losing power in previous years. So this uh, overall upgrade of the, I believe it's square D panels and rewiring of the system should help alleviate that. Um, an interruption of the elevator. Um, so if there are any questions on that, we have uh, these gentlemen here tonight. Uh, if that's all, then that concludes our report. Thank you, Mr. Haynes. And attached, we should have the year-to-date building and grounds report, contractor's report, and our projects list. And we all should have received facilities use schedules list. Any questions, board directors? Yes. I have one. Yes. So I had a chance to uh, go up to York High uh, maybe two weeks ago to check out the basement of York High. Uh, I know um, our STEAM Academy at the high school is in a very small space. Um, they're in a small space and they have carpet in that space. So when it comes to the activities that they do in that space, it's not very safe. <laughs> it's not very safe in that space. So. Um, me, me and Director Orr went down there and just to check out that entire area and we feel like it's a perfect space to help STEAM expand, of course, and also have a safe space to go with all the equipment that's already down there. Um, my question is, is there a way that we can make that happen? Uh, is there a way to like, yeah, to utilize that space or renovate the space to make sure it's up to code? Um, because it, it, just, it just makes sense. So it does make sense, but they have some pathway plans for that space and also ROT, J, um, junior, JROTC is down there. So um, if they can all fit, I mean, you know, that's certainly up to um, principal still. Mm -hmm. And, um, but um, there, there are several other folks down there right now, like JROTC needs that space. They can't be where the carpet is either. They, so he, he took us on a tour. He, told, he showed us where they are. And they're in a whole separate wing. But they're in the same, in that same vicinity downstairs oh. there. So, and they have pathway plans for the other side. Got but it. that's not to say that steam can't fit. I don't know. That, that's a, that's a principal still question. I mean, he, you know, I, I know that there's pathway plans coming. So, and, and I, like I know. The, I like to weigh in on that. We could have buildings and ground and Mr. Steele come in and talk to us about what the conditions of that building in that space is before we have a conversation about that because the, all of the board members are privy to some of the information that you're talking about tonight. I am, but we need to get a full assessment of what's going on and then we can have a full conversation. So we could take with that conversation until we have that information from the principal as well as buildings and grounds. So do you want him in July or August? 
August will be fine. Okay. Yeah, August will be fine. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, to piggyback on what the director uh, was saying too. Uh, yeah, that space that we looked at, yeah, would be appropriate for steam because the room that they're in now, uh, principal still said it's not suitable for them. It's not secure or it's not safe. Yeah. He's the for principal. Some reason. So, yeah, so <laughs> he's to have him in here to, yeah, to tell us all about that, so, yeah, yeah, would be yeah. good. And, and I'm trying to understand because I know STEAM are using some spaces, but that's not the only space. No, it's not. So, mm -hmm. when we talk about not. STEAM and the whole scope of what they utilize, I think that that doesn't encompass the whole conversation in terms of where they are located. They in also the use the library sometimes. They use a lot of places in the school, so we need to do a full assessment of that when we have a conversation with the principal. That way we could all know. Thank you, Director Thompson. Appreciate that in Director Orr. Any other questions for directors? I don't have a question, just a comment. Looking at the um, the uh, project list, it's nice to see a bunch of yellow completed stuff. It's really nice to see, <laughs> see things getting completed, so. Any questions, Dr. Barry? Oh, man. That concludes my report, Director, I mean, President Breland. Thank you, Madam Ladies. At this time, we'll move on to our cafeteria agenda. Ms. Wilkes, Chair. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Um, two members are accounted for and two are absent this evening. I'm going to ask if Mark can come up and give his report. You will find that there's an attachment for 2A. An uh, Aramark diversity attachment for 2B and 2C, it talks about the summer lunch fire. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, just have a few things to cover for the month of May for food service. Um, going down the list here, we did a lot of events in May. We did 23 events, uh, everything from staff appreciation uh, to moving up ceremonies in the school. We did the National Honor Society induction ceremony, some training meetings. Uh, and like I said on my notes, all told, provided about 1,800 meetings for the events in the month of May. Uh, and I think everybody really enjoyed them. Um, for commodities, we received $36,732 in commodities for the month of May and distributed $41,777 of that stock to schools. And our ending inventory for our items in the high school is $51,936. Um, we, uh, we started our summer feeding program today. Um, it runs through August 3rd. We had a little bit of a slow start because of the weather. The parks canceled on us, but hopefully we'll be able to get them up and running tomorrow. Um, we have five open sites. And then for ongoing projects, I just highlighted the changes. Um, we had a new grease trap installed last week at Devers. Um, in fact, I was there this morning and they were putting the new top quarry tile down in the kitchen. Um, we did have uh, oh, the walk-in freezer system uh, replaced at Good uh, last week, Tuesday. Um, they're replacing the grease trap this week at STEAM. And at the high school, um, we're in the process right now of having the new hood uh, fan uh, rewired and reprogrammed for the unit. Um, we did two, uh, both commodity freezers early May. Uh, we received a new hot box, a new heated cabinet, and then we also received two new registers and 10 new keypads to process the kids through the through the lunch line. So a lot going on, but uh, we're up for the challenge. Do I have any questions? I do have a question. Do we know when Jackson is going to be fixed or tentatively? Because with it's the, been on here for a couple of times. Yeah, now. I spoke with Brian Jetsek um, last week, and he said that he has the parts coming in. It'll definitely be done before the end of summer, though. Just a comment. Thanks for the croutons being You're welcome. separated. You're welcome, Neil. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Kamishak, I do have a question. And my question goes to the commodities. And we had a conversation last month after you left. And my question goes to how often are they inspected in terms of the rotation of the foods in the commodities, wherever they're kept, and how they're going through and how we move things up? Every month we do an inventory down there, and every month we look at the dates and we make sure that everything is rotated and up to date at the end of each month. And that's where I get this number from when I tell you how much we've got in stock. 
And how long are we keeping certain foods? For example, give me an example for meats. If we keep the meats, how long are we keeping them past our expiration date? We don't keep anything past its expiration date. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, Director Barry, do you have any remarks? <laughs> Thank you. So in my report. <laughs> Thank you, President Breland. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, we have two board members present who are, are absent for education committee tonight. Uh, first up is um, Dr. Barry. And um, would you like Ms. Rowland to go first? Or you want to go? Ms. Washington? You want to? Thank you. You're good. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. I'm going to keep it brief. Hello. Um, thank you for allowing me to work with reconnect with our young people. Wednesdays were my favorite day um, as they came over to the church and just roll through it. because I'm not going to keep them um, as you with our needs and our goals and our target audience. One of the things I liked about our young people was when they came, they held each other accountable and they brought their friends. So it just kept growing and the word kept spreading and I would get an inbox. Hey, can so so come, come on over. You can go to the next slide. The other thing that was supportive was as we were posting our little TikTok videos, um, local restaurants in the communities started feeding our kids good mm -hmm. meals and it became a game like, where are we eating today, miss? I'm like, okay. <laughs> so we started with our seniors um, and then towards right before Christmas, our juniors came in. And now, even though school's over, we are still working with the juniors and the current ju juniors who are now seniors and the sophomores who are now juniors, because you have a lot of students who have the ability to graduate early. Mm -hmm. So they want to be prepared and planned. One of the things we learned, um, one of the things I was sharing with the board is one of the goals we had was our students would apply to more than five colleges. That is necessary because it gives them leverage to negotiate. Yeah. Our students in the program received more than 168 college acceptance letters. 87.5 of the students who took the SATs did increase their scores. Um, I will pause here and say there was a rumor out there before that said students don't need SAT scores. Our okay. students learned this semester that is not true. That's right. Yes. That's right. Scholarships are determined by those scores. Um, based on what major you're going to major in in college, you have to have a cutoff score for math or reading, or you have to take a remedial course in college, and that doesn't count. So now you're spending extra money. Mm -hmm. um, some of the students who wanted to apply to certain outside scholarships learned they didn't have what they needed to get there. And then a lot of our students who applied to our HBCUs kindly learned 90% of our HBCUs require SAT scores. Mm -hmm. So it kind of sparked a plug under, for our ju current juniors and sophomores. When we talk about merit-based scholarships, we look at the awards they received and we multiply that by four. And when we added up all of the merit-based scholarships for the students who participated, that was the total. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just the SAT prep, it wasn't just the college navigation, you can go to the next slide. It was about the acceptances. So just a few of our students, you can just keep going. Jaquan Franklin, um, I'll pause here. One of the things I liked with his mom, the partnership with the parents was the most powerful. Doing their relationships was the most powerful. Um, I tease them, they call me auntie now and I call them nephews and I call their parents family because I'll get text messages, miss, he got a 15, there's a $15,000 outstanding balance for this one, should we commit? No, not when you have $800 out of pocket for IUP and 1000 out of pocket for Shippensburg, there's a difference. Mm -hmm. You have options. Mm -hmm. That's right. Choose the one, go where the money resides. Mm -hmm. 
you don't need plus loans. We don't need extra loans. Go where the money resides. So having those parents text me and call and say, hey, what now? What do we do here? What do I need? That's been the most powerful um, piece from this project that I didn't anticipate and really fell in love with. So you have um, Mr. Stevenson, our homecoming king, 18 colleges. Um, you see the merit-based offers he received. We keep going, Mikey Gray is going to Kutztown. Um, Ajay Shabazz, can I pause here? This young lady came in um, not believing in herself uh, because she transferred from another school and was told she didn't have what it needed to make it. And when she saw herself, you can go to the next slide, get into all those colleges, her confidence went up. Oh, that's right. She and her mother then took a trip down to North Carolina and decided what was the best fit for them. And she's going to Fayetteville University, Fayetteville State University. Two things, I wanted to debunk a myth. Out-of-state colleges are cheaper sometimes. Um, Elizabeth City State College in um, Fayetteville have what's called the North Carolina Promise Program. Out-of-state tuition is $5,000 huh. for the year. Huh. Yes. So her mom is not experiencing an out-of-pocket cost. You can go to the next one. Our student president and his beautiful student speech at graduation. <laughs> um, I want to publicly want to thank Dr. Barry. Uh, some of our students had to learn about Cheney University, the Cheney University. And with her assistance, we were able to make some inroads. I do believe Mr. Hunt's going to be circling back to you. He now wants to be a Cheney man. <laughs> So that's J. Ron. Um, you can just keep going. Um, McBride, a uh, great story about him. We know he transferred here. He had some hills to climb. Um, we partnered him with OVR. He was able to secure a grant from OVR. His father is not paying anything out of pocket for this young man to go to college. And he will be playing at Mr. Cordia. Um, Sam, you know, he graduated early. He had a couple of offers as well. He improved his, he took his SAT in 10th grade. And that's something I do want to point out. You don't, seniors should not be taking the SAT. Seniors should not be taking the SAT. Sophomores should take the SAT the end of the school year because it gives them an opportunity to prepare for the end, for the PSAT, which is a National Merit-Based Scholarship SAT, PSAT in November. Once their score is higher, they then begin to compete for merit-based scholarships. That is what Sam did. And the other young man you're going to see, um, Montrez Jackson. Um, that's Jasir. He's going to Cheney. And then these are the other students who participate in our programs. They live in our district. Omarion Newsom is going to Florida Memorial. He's leaving next week. He'll be doing a summer program and playing basketball there. And Montrez, if we can pause here, he's the other student who took the SAT in 10th grade. So we use two portals, the Common App Portal and what we call the HBCU Common App Portal. If you apply early in the Common App Portal, the application fee for colleges is not there. And with the HBCU Common App, it's $20, and that goes out to 67 HBCUs. I want to thank the counselors, the staff. They were always responsive and uploading things we needed. The other thing we worked on was what we call academic resumes. When the students actually did the resumes, this is what it looks like. It's different from a typical resume. This is what we teach our young people how to create to apply for scholarships. Um, and some of them are very successful with it. This is the list of our students who I'm working with now. Um, like I said, each day they keep bringing more friends. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, but we are working and meeting together during the summer at the York Young Thinkers program on Sundays um, from 11.30 to 2.30. So thank you. Any questions? I have a comment. I think this is awesome. When we, you know, back in my day, of course, we didn't have these programs to wrap around us. We had to figure it out unless you had a good guidance counselor in a strong family unit, but um, this is, I am very excited and happy to know that you're working with our kids on this level. It just warms my heart. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you, it's a team effort. I'm appreciative for the counselors, the teachers, um, the coaches, it, it's a team effort. When somebody doesn't show up for uh, class, uh, we start texting and the kids hold them accountable. 
So it's really a team effort. Um, they know we will show up at their house or wherever they are, track them on TikTok, whatever, and find you, get the class. So it's a team effort, and thank you. Uh, I'll echo the same sentiments and just just recognizing that, um, you know, seeing our kids in our in our district when we know that they can excel, but now everyone else knows that they that they can and they have the ability and it's exciting to to um, see the glow in their eyes when they've recognized that they are worthy of um, a scholarship and they've met whatever criteria that they that they've met and they aren't entering um, post-secondary education with needing to spend a year in remediation and understanding what that difference is and what that balance is. So thank you so much for um, providing that opportunity and um, in building the relationships. It's key. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Washington. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I'm going to take you way back. Okay. When, <laughs> when I know this, where you're going. When this was just a dream. Yeah. And it was during the time when we first got placed on the empowerment list here in York, and we created the African American and Latino male task force that we are a part of, and out of that came the new hustle. Yeah. And you talked about what you wanted to do in terms of helping our young people overcome these hurdles and these other obstacles that are put in their way. And one of the thing I want to one of the things I want to thank you for is that you never ever wavered in your commitment. To wanting the best for our children and i thank you thank you it's been a long road and now the fruits of that labor are coming to fruition thank you thank you thank you well i want to just say to about this young lady right here she has a lot of hats on her not only is she chairperson for naacp york branch she's been elevated to the state chairperson of the eds committee right on with you, Sherry, and I'm trying to work with you when I can, so but you know how to get in touch with me whenever you need me. Thank you. You're doing a great job, honey. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, Dr. Barry. While we're waiting for just to get the presentation up, I do want to say to Ms. Washington, thank you for teaching our kids how to take care of each other. Because of her and the work that she's done, they're holding each other accountable. They're going to get each other. They're saying, look, we got to do this. The, the, the guys last year had a pat. They're all going to graduate. They're all going to do this. And, you know, this year is no different. The kids are learning to take care of one another because of the work that you're doing. And we appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, our learning safely updates. So um, a couple of updates from my office. Did you notice something different? There's, there's, there's no more COVID stuff. You know, I took it out temporarily, probably, but you know, it's out for now. <laughs> it's been, it's been low for ten weeks, so I feel like you know we can come off it for a little while. But hopefully, I won't have to put it back in in the fall. But um, just a few updates from the superintendent's office. Um, the HR department has worked diligently to get um, positions full and um, filled that have been vacated. Um, currently, the district has 27 teacher openings and 22 ESP openings. So that office is gonna be busy all summer making sure that those openings get filled. And I wish I could tell you that that's gonna be the final numbers, but we all know that when a school year starts, because you know this is my pet peeve, I'm gonna get on my soapbox. Um, because Pennsylvania doesn't do anything about letting people know when you leave, they leave whenever. And so we get stuck trying to start the year with no teacher because someone decided they were gonna leave September 1st. So um, again, you know, that number will likely rise, but um, I do think that um, that department along with um, E3 has helped us to look at the recruitment process differently and to do some different things. So speaking of different things, last month, the HR department um, did a district-wide job fair 
and there were 56 people that signed in. Um, ARA interview um, had 11 people apply on paper and five on the website, and they spoke to all one, 11 people. Um, special Ed had 10 apply and spoke to eight to 10 people. Buildings and Grounds spoke to 11 people and two applied online. And security um, had eight apply and they spoke to 15 people. So um, I would say that um, just the FaceTime alone made it a success. And, um, you know, that anything that we can do to highlight the district and what we have to offer, um, we have some great benefits and it's a great place to work. So we'll just continue to plug along trying to get people to come. Last week, um, the schools participated in a um, multi-day E3 professional development, which highlighted PLC work. Um, I wanna thank the staff, um, Dr. Gloucester's shop. They put a lot of time planning into that and it was very successful and it was very well attended. And we really appreciate um, the whole leadership team that jumped in. I think Dr. Foster was involved. Um, Miss um, um, Special Ed was involved. I think somebody from Special Ed was there. Yeah, so all the departments were represented and um, our staff got a chance to, you know, dig deep in some, some much needed PLC work. So kudos to you because it's not always easy to do professional development. It's that much harder when the school year ended that week. So, <laughs> so good job. Oh, yes, that's right, Dr. Miles as well, absolutely. And I'm sure she did a lot of the talking. <laughs> so, you know, that's her sweet spot, you know. <laughs> so um, there's an abundance of contracts on this agenda, as you've seen, and on for this month. If you have any questions that are specific to contracts, please don't hesitate to contact me directly between um, the committee meeting and a board meeting, or I'm happy to answer as much as I can today. So please, I know it's a lot, but um, unfortunately, we're not the district that we were say six, seven years ago, and we have a boatload of contracts. And because of the procurement processes and all of the different things that are going on now, we now have to renew contracts every year, specifically those that are paid for with grants. So those contracts typically end June 30th and begin July 1st. So that is why you have an abundance of them on the agenda. Um, and to that end, I know that um, we usually only have um, a meeting in July for personnel, and it's usually a few minutes, but we do have some contracts that may have to go on there. I, will, I promise to try to keep them to a minimum, um, under five if I can, but unfortunately there were some that didn't make it because there were some procurement things that just didn't get cleared up, whether it was that we didn't get them to Jeff or there were some language changes that we didn't get in time. So I understand it is your time and I will be very cognizant of it, but um, we probably will have a few contracts on the July meeting for with, along with personnel. We are gearing up for summer programs. Um, just to name a few, we have Summer Slam, which is the district-wide summer school program from K to 12. We also have the BOSS program, which is rising ninth graders. Um, we have the Rising K program, which is the pre-Kers going to kindergarten. We have ESY. There's also another program that Special Ed runs, the Transition. Are you guys doing that this year? The Transition program, there's several different ones. And this year we're doing something a little bit different. We have some enrichment camps that are going on. They're like week-long camps that are going on um, on various topics. So there are a whole lot of summer opportunities for our kids to both keep them off the streets and, um, you know, avoid the summer slide and, you know, get meals and, and do all the fun things that they do during the school year. It is an abbreviated day um, and they do not come on Fridays. And they also um, have the opportunity to get fresh fruits and vegetables weekly from a grant. So we're looking forward to that. Um, the district annual report is being crafted for distribution. We're hoping to have that finished by the 30th and be ready for distribution on the 1st. It will contain any and all information from the 2022-23 school year. And by the way, your picture looks very nice in there. So that you took the other the last month. So um, looking forward to that. Okay, so. We have some updates from CNI. Um, Dr. Foster, do you want to go over these updates? 
Okay. Craig, show his mic if you want. If you want. It is Sean's mic. He has the most of the time. Yeah. Yeah, Sean, how do you work the mic? <laughs> Thank you, Sean, for your mic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berry, for allowing me to share uh, such wonderful updates that we have in the Department of Curriculum and Instruction uh, as far as written and assessed curriculum. And we know that there are three different parts of curriculum that braid and come all together. The assessed curriculum, where we measure how well students have performed, the written curriculum that we utilize at the district level to guide what the instruction should be, and the taught curriculum that teachers engage in every day on a day to day basis. We are responsible for providing uh, sound and rigorous written and assessed curriculum. What we have done this school year is we have revised and updated English language arts curriculum from K to eight to ensure that it is much more rigorous, much more tightly aligned. What we don't want our scholars to do is engage in curriculum and then they get to the state assessment and it's a surprise. Whether it's that it's stamina, depth and breadth of what they're reading, that they're not reading enough. Uh, for example, in third grade, it's very heavy in nonfiction and narrative. It's not a lot of fiction. There's a lot of fiction in fourth grade. We want to ensure that students have exposure to those types of things. So that's what we're engaging students in. In mathematics, we've revised K to eight for those very same reasons. Uh, we have also revised the mathematics curriculum, uh, the assessed curriculum for mathematics, again, to increase rigor. What we've learned over the years is that our state assessments aren't necessarily content assessments. They are reading assessments that measure students' ability to do content. So as long as we can expose them to the various reading passages and real life applications to what they engage in, the better off they are. That is in partnership with Dr. Gloucester's office uh, with data and assessment. So that has been a team effort all year. And we also have a contractual agreement to revise our English language development curriculum K through 12. That is huge. Uh, as we learned in our program review, that was something that was recommended that we do yesterday. But it's going to take us time to get that done. So as we begin this school year, we're starting in the place where really it matters most, and that's high school. So we'll be engaging and revising high school English language development curriculum, uh, provided the board says yes, we literally will begin the very next day in beginning to engage in revising that curriculum. Uh, we have had some ad adjustments in curricular resources. Again, making sure that we expose students to not just content and resources that are rigorous, but also what looks like them. We are a school district of heavy brown and black children, so we want to expose them in grades K to four as well as five through eight. What literacy has been written by black and brown authors? Uh, what allows you to see yourself in that content? So we have done that uh, for this school year, and we've also done something that's pretty courageous. We've identified a bridge resource for mathematics. And we'll talk about this that's upcoming uh, to replace Go Math and Glencoe Math. Uh, that was not an easy decision to make. However, it is one that is absolutely critical for our students. It is a completely 100% digital resource known as Open Up. We will pay nothing for Open Up, uh, and we will talk about its alignment in a moment. It, but what it does is it allows our teachers and students to be able to provide the depth and breadth for them daily. Right now, there are some places in Glencoe Math and in Go Math, to, I'll be transparent with you, that our students do not have access to, to that resource for the state assessment. There are certain parts of it that just doesn't cover it, so we needed to find resources to fill in the gaps. And what better than, as my uncle calls it, free 99 to be able to provide that. Uh, and we anticipate selection of, provided that the board says yes, uh, an English language development intervention for students. Uh, that was also part of our program review that we begin to literally uh, embrace their uh, exposure to English language acquisition. And that will be with Imagine Learning Language and Literacy. Uh, it provides extensive exposure to students to be able to gain experience in English language acquisition uh, in over 15 different languages if necessary to begin. 
the school year if they have to, and then bridge them into English language, uh, into English only instruction. It's done during intervention time. It allows for students to be able to hear it and practice one on one. But what makes it even better than other programs is that it provides correction. So if a student is, and we know our English language is unique, left, left, and left can mean three different things. But if a student learns and says left, but that's not correct, the program will self-correct in real time for them. They can practice at home, uh, they can practice here at school, et cetera. I think I have one more slide. Uh, so again, continue with our updates. As we talk about what do we do with old resources? We know that we have goo gobs of old resources. Uh, we have a wonderful partnership with a nonprofit uh, called the Liberia School Public School Project based here locally in York. And what they do is they take any old resource, new resources and outdated and no longer in use technology and they provide it to schools in Liberia. Uh, and so what we would like to do with all of our Go Math is have a charitable donation to be able to give them those resources. In Liberia, they are book hungry. They're actually book starved. Uh, so we want to make sure that they have that. But I want to give you the background so you know why we're asking that as the board uh, needs to approve that. Go Math, according to board policy, was slated to sunset not this year, but the year prior. Uh, as I shared with you, it is poorly aligned to Pennsylvania Math Common Core. Uh, we measure that via Ed Reports, and when I consider Ed Reports, it is a nonprofit go-to organization that literally for free does reviews from universities, campuses, and colleges of what do these resources do for students. What we know for Go Math is that Go Math is not aligned to Common Core. Glencoe math is, I'm sorry, Go math is partially aligned. Glencoe math is not aligned. So we would like to be able to replace them and utilize open up as a bridge just for a year. So that way we can go through what is required by the board to adopt a committee, determine what would be best for use. Open up not only meets uh, those common core requirements, it's also very user friendly for teachers. So we've introduced it to teachers in May during the election day, so that way they can begin to just, you know, feel around, poke around, see what it is that they like and how they like it. And we also have slated five professional learning opportunities for teachers uh, in partnership with Dr. Miles and the E3 team to be able to expose them uh, to what this looks like and how do we lesson plan now with this digital resource. Uh, so hoping that the board will say yes uh, to being able to not only shed old resources, but to shed Go Math and Glencoe Math, knowing that we really want to do what's best for our scholars uh, and to be able to adopt Open Up uh, just for this bridge resource. And I'm uh, happy to take any questions or to save them to the end uh, when Dr. Barry is finished. I just have a question about, um, well, first of all, thank you for the explanation of the, of the process and um, where we're at and what changes we need to make. When it comes to the um, the open up mathematics new curriculum, this bridge curriculum, how um, what is the plan to introduce that to um, to families so that there is an understanding of what those changes are going to be um, in the process and how they can how um, families can support their students at home. Thank you for that question, uh, Director Kennedy. One of the ways that we can share with families what has occurred is to simply provide a blurb that not only goes on their website, we can also provide documentation and uh, wording uh, when we have open house so that way they're aware. And we can also even provide materials that principals send home whenever we start the school year. Uh, lots of times we're sending home, what materials do you need? This is what we're also getting. So that way they're aware that you can access open up from anywhere. You don't have a laptop, no worries. You can use your phone and you'll be able to open it up and see it that way. But those are the ways that we intend to communicate with our families so they're aware. Thank you. Just one quick question as it relates to Liberia Public School Project. Yes, sir. They're educating both women. Males and females. Yes. Okay, thank you, because that's very important. Yes, yes. It is open uh, to all uh, age children in Liberia. Yes. And Dr. Berry, I think I don't have any more questions. I'll turn Sean's mic off and give it back to you. So just a few dates looking ahead. Um, the 19th, um, offices are closed for observation of Juneteenth. That's correct, right? 
Yeah. All right, just making sure. <laughs> the 21st through the 23rd district um, leaders retreat will be going on um, on from the 26th to the 27th. Um, the district leadership retreat will continue. And then the 28th and 29th, we have the cabinet retreat and um, the offices are closed for the ESP peak picnic on the 30th. And then of course, July 4th is Independence Day. And that concludes my report. Does anyone have questions? Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Barry. All right, board members, we have a plethora of um, contracts and whatnot to, um, to have reviewed. Um, if there are any questions, I, um, I do have several questions, but they're very, well, what I think is very simple um, questions to ask. One, just one comment initially is several of these are, are quotes or proposals. So when will they become actual contracts? I'm asking that question so that if we're looking at something that says it's $5 and when it comes back, it might be 10. So what, how are we handling the ones that are considered proposals over a contract? I think some of them that are considered proposals are because we haven't gotten a contract yet from the vendors. And then that's what I was saying. We can always table some of those if we don't have contracts um, for, for July. But like I said, I'm trying to keep them at a minimum so we're not here, you know, long. Right. But, and, um, and I think that that makes sense. So, for instance, is there are several that are quotes or, or proposals. And if for some reason you don't have the contract by the time next week that we vote, if, even if they have to go in in July, we've already seen them just so to ensure that there aren't any changes um, if it has to go on on July 1. So I just wanted to put that put that out there that I noticed there were some differences in uh, language. Um, board members, any questions on any of them? Because I can start running through my couple of lists really quick. Um, <clears throat> Under item three for the Lotus number uh, 3A, the very first one. Uh, what was my question? The other way, Jess. 3A. What, what is the, the cost for this one? Is it, It's for psychological services, but the, the cost is not included. So is the cost going to be per evaluation or per Per hour spent with a student. It's for a bad evaluation. Okay. Okay. Next up with three B um, for learn well. What students are going to be serviced with this? Are these sped students, or what? What students are going to be serviced with? this contract, because it doesn't really clarify. I had a question for that also, because uh, uh, it just says one student or a student. Well, so that's, that yeah, that's why I asked. Child? I actually have to look back into that one, because I'm not sure of the language for that. Okay. Oh, okay, thank you. I was like, I don't It's a place. It's a place. So, so they have gone through this program already. Correct. That that is a, a placement that we have for students that uh, not could not be placed in um, the other facility. So that's why we had learned well. So this it's is a new name of an agency. It's a new. It's a placement. It's a new. It's a, it's a placement. new placement. Out of school placement. Where is it located? Out of school placement. I'll, I can get you that information. Never heard of it. It's a newer one. Unfortunately, we are struggling to get placements because the, the normal placements are full and um, our kids are maxing out. You know, we're maxing out. And remember, we share some of those slots with place with the, um, the Division of Juvenile Services and you know, if the if they get placed through them, sometimes they get it before we do. And so 
we're just running, we're running out of placements. And, you know, the further out we go, the more it costs. Yeah. So um, that's one that the state recommended. Um, my next question is 3A, the Adams and Associates Job Corps Agreement. I just had a, um, there's no cost to this contract for the, for the Job Corps, but I just was wondering how do we utilize this? It's not the right way I want to ask the question. Um, how are these services implemented? Because it's especially designed for students who potentially may want to, to drop out or um, do something else. So how, how do we implement this to ensure that it is shared and um, effectively utilized? And is that done early on in the process? Or like we having that conversation that right now with, with juniors who are new seniors that may be on the fence or whatever? We're working currently with students that we would love for them to remain with us. But for many reasons, they feel Job Corps is um, the most logical place to go. If they go to Job Corps, then we would lose um, a pathway for them and they would just be off of our, we wouldn't get credit for them. But now if we have a partnership with them, that is a viable option. Of course, we want everyone to graduate and be Bearcats. But we all know that due to, due to other reasons out of our control, especially now with some of the mental health and things that are happening with our scholars, we cannot get them all the resources needed. And sometimes a choice like Job Corps is uh, feasible for them, but then it also is a possible pathway for graduation so that instead of getting a negative, we could get a positive. Right. But we are definitely utilizing everything we can to have students remain within the school district of the city of Florida. Thank you. Um, I'm chairperson. I had a, a question on item 3C. I know oh. we were down to 3E, but that's I'm going to jump back up to 3C, this I wonder professional learning agreement. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the um, EL curriculum that Dr. Foster just talked about for oh, our okay. English language learners. Okay. What's your question? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In other words, our teachers now are needing more help than we're providing for them. That's why we have to bring in all these outside. Um, not ne not necessarily. I mean, they're they're always. Ideally, we know that professional development and programming is not one size fits all, right? So the, the goal eventually, especially in the area of intervention, is to have a menu of interventions to choose from, because if you are struggling with um, comprehension, you need a different program and a different teaching style than if you are struggling with phonemic awareness. So we need to be able to diagnose the problem and intervene properly with the proper stuff. Right now, we are limited in the amount of programming that we offer for intervention. And ELD pretty much had nothing. They were using the Gen Ed curriculum and not having supplements to meet their needs. So that is why we were looking at the EL curriculum. So it's not necessarily that the teachers need more help, it's that we're offering more options to be able to meet different needs. Just, <clears throat> I'm looking here at item three and Young Thinkers of York incorporating the 21st century MOUs. Who could talk more about that program and how that's gonna be introduced and how our students going to be engaged in that process. So the young thinkers of New York has been a part of the 21st century grant since its inception and we have to have partners outside as a part of that grant and Ray Ames does do a very good job with I was this, ask, was with, this Mr. Ames. It is Mr. Ames. Okay, it is is his program and he does a great job with the kids. Um, he's done some stuff with our pre-K kids as well as the 21st century students. And it is a, um, a way for us to have a community partner 
and to get some high quality um, STEAM instruction for our kids. And I didn't see any names. That's why I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. It's him. Whenever you see young thinkers, it's him. <laughs> So what was the other one that you asked no, about? That was the only one. Oh, okay. I thought it was young thinkers or something else. With the 21st century I'm Okay. Okay. <clears throat> There's some other ones in there, like um, we do play and learns in the 21st century grant, but they didn't write it in this time. So we're gonna pick that up um, somewhere else, maybe first 10 or somewhere else. But um, we have to have so many partnerships with them as a um, part of that grant. Dr. Barry, ma'am, can you explain what three AK is capturing kids' hearts? Is I never heard of that before. Dr. Gloucester. Thank you. Good afternoon. So, capturing kids' hearts is an initiative that we are looking to institute at all of our schools, but we'll be focusing first at Devers K-8. It is an opportunity for our leaders to really move into supporting our teachers, into fostering an inclusive school for all students, right? It's, it's the idea and the adage of, you may forget what someone has said to you, but you'll never forget how you made them feel. And so we're fostering this culture of capturing our students' hearts so that we can reach their minds and their spirits. And so it'll be a year long series that the Devers team will go through first. Um, there'll be two days of intensive PD, um, and then they'll have a year long level of support. Well, they'll have teacher champions. Uh, the principal will be able to be a part of a national cohort to support that work there. And the idea really is to not only um, foster this inclusive culture of belonging in the building with, amongst the students, but likewise the teachers to see their students as, stu as, as people. Um, mm -hmm. So we're looking to start that work at Devers. It's my understanding that Principal Miles, Dr. Miles did that during her tenure at McKinley several years ago. Um, and personally, I had an opportunity to be trained probably in 2010 years and years ago. So this is something that's been nationally recognized and has been instituted um, you know, across the country. And we're really super excited about doing that work. It also aligns to the equity priorities that we have. Um, so helping our teachers again to, and our leaders to see our students as people um, and capturing their hearts to the extent that we create this inclusive culture of belonging in the buildings. Absolutely. I had a question about um, the um, LIU contracts and just reading over over them for, for pricing and it lays out the pricing. One price I, I assume is for prep and I need to pull it up and one is for presentation, um, but the cost in saying that for four half days of professional development, um, to be held once per marking period as needed. So who determines the as needed? Like who? Uh, three um, P. There's several different. There's several. There's several different LIU ones, but they say um, the same one. So I'm looking at three with the uh, $17,000 contract. And then when you break it down, it has four, that is P, right? Yeah. It has four sections, um, but it says, you know, under quarter one, it's, you know, four, four half days to be held once per marking period as needed, $1,000 for prep and $1,000. I'm assuming prep is, that's what it is. And Perez is presentation, I don't know. But there's there's different costs. But who determines the the as needed? Because if we're we're agreeing to this contract, looks like this one. Are you asking if the as needed is coming from their end or our end or both? It's it's always our. I'm sorry. It's always so they work in concert with us, right? So the contract is with us. So, and again, I'm not. I don't oversee that directly the 21st century after school program, but typically when we go into agreements with IU 12 or any of the IUs, we work in concert with them to share with them the scope of work that should occur. 
if we're able to complete that work stream and you know if we use each of our wednesdays and one month then that'll work um if we are able to complete the work stream prior to that then we're able to recompense that those resources back and use them for another day um, but we make the decision based upon um the level of work that's been completed um, so I know, like, for example, there's some work that's going to be like some curriculum writing that'll be occurring during the summer. I think Dr. Foster spoke to some of that um, as we're looking at our ELD curriculum writing for the high school. So based upon the number of days that we predict out helps us to identify, you know, what we'll be working on. And if we need more days, then, then we'll be able to come back for that. But if we're able to complete it prior to that, then we're able to recompense that in a different way. But we make the decision to answer your question directly the extent to which, uh, you know, when we need those days to be completed out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then my last question is about the, um, the Family First Health Agreement. Um, so there's one rate that's three a h. There's there's one. There's a three hundred dollar rate for services rendered, and then there's a three twenty five for. Here it is. So it's three hundred dollars per hour for um, professional services for delivering of care, and then it's three twenty five an hour for coordination, prep, and travel. So each one of those items is a separate thing. So we, we're going to pay them $300 an hour to, to deliver the service, but then we're going to pay them $325 an hour for to, to transport and prepare for the delivering of the service? For that family first health, yes. we, we're looking at to bring them back from um, what we needed for um, our medical services when they received uh, the doctoral when we got our um, physicals. Uh -huh. So that was what was the language, what we had in the previous contract. That's what we had prior to COVID. For the last two years, we did not have um, school mandated physicals. So to do that, that was the previous language that we had. And that's what it was done for, as we had to do all of our school buildings in um, grades three, six, and 11. So that's what was previously, that's what we had. Did that answer the question or? No. Um, You're trying to find out, are they gonna come for the, when the doctor comes out? to do the mandated physicals or in, in the materials that he has to bring? Okay. So there's two separate contracts. One is for services for pediatric doctor come in, the dental program, Correct. all that. Okay. That's, that's the 325 one with the travel. And then the other contract is that for that's physicals? For, that's for the physicals. So that's, that's for, for our physical. So we've run into a glitch better. with OSS and our physicals, so they can't accommodate the on-site physicals. Well, that makes that's why I asked the question. So that makes sense. We're now, we're going to marry one thing. services it, it, with yeah. <laughs> them to try to make up for it. because historically, ninety percent of our kids get their physicals at school right. from sports. Well, OSS is now saying they're not coming to school to do physicals. So although we have a contract with them for the trainer, you know, we need to fill that gap. Yeah. And Family First Health doesn't have the capacity to take it on totally. We still have to use OSS some, but they're willing to take on some of it and help us out with the with the on-site physical. Okay. So that is why it's two separate contracts. Does and that's that make why, sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense now that you explained it because when you look at this, it it's like they were paying three hundred dollars to do the service and then three hundred twenty five dollars to come and set up for the service. <laughs> but after you gave that explanation, it's clear. It doesn't it doesn't yeah. um, <clears throat> indicate that it's two separate contracts. That's why I asked the the question. Um, uh, 
And then, I, I'm sorry, I lied. I said that was my last question. This is my last one. On the, um, the two community and schools contract, I don't understand why there's two different contracts in both the community, uh, three AQ. Okay, I can explain that. Okay. So we utilize Esser's money to pay for communities and schools. Mm -hmm. And because we utilize Esther's money, we can't enter multi-year contracts because yeah. it, it yeah, has to be a year to by year. Right. And our community, we, we received a grant, um, a slant grant through communities and schools that has a matching component. And that grant will add two additional schools for three years. But we can't enter a three year contract. We can only do it year by year. Okay. So the slant grant is one contract. And then the other contract is our traditional okay. communities and schools contract. Okay. And this might be a longer conversation because the communities and schools contracts is a lot of money and, and they do a lot, but I would just like in another time have a, um, a detailed conversation about the impact of their work, but that's another another meeting. I they were dying a, to come and, and, and present data. I was like, not this month. <laughs> so, so we'll have them in August. Any other questions board member Dorn? Yeah, board? I do. Item 3T. What's this flexible instructional day? So FID days are what used to be snow days. We used to build snow days into the calendar. So because of online learning and our ability to do, the state has come up with a system called flexible instruction days. And it's something that we have to apply for to get. We can get five. Every three years, we have to reapply for them. So this is the third year. So we have to apply again. It doesn't cost us anything, but the board has to approve it. So if we have weather days, we can use mm -hmm. a flexible instruction day instead of having to make up a day. Okay, so the snow days are gonna be- Snow days are pretty much obsolete. Them. Like they're well, unless- yeah, we didn't have any this uh, year. Unless we're we like- Having snow. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. 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 They have the ability to work at home mm -hmm. and this, mm -hmm. PDE has put this system into place and they want to make sure that the board knows that we have a plan mm -hmm. if the kids are off school it has lesson plans it has this it has that and so we have to get that approved by you all before we can submit it and it has to be it has to be sent up to them as part of the application okay okay and it has to be a roll call vote okay okay and then I'm looking at this items, there's three of them, actually, 3AE, AF, and AG, the interpreters. There's three of them. They're what? I'm sorry? The interpreters. Mm -hmm. 3AE, AF, and AG. Right. Those are folks that interpret for us for parent-teacher conferences, day-to-day, -day, uh -huh. um, testing um, modifications and um, accommodations. So those are folks that we have on on contracts to help us with. Okay, so they come as needed, or they're here. They all come. The time? They they come as needed. Okay, they're not here all the time. No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and my last thing was three uh, S. Do we know who the ghetto ghetto Vaughn law <laughs> firm is? <laughs> Do we know those folks? <laughs> is, is, is this a different lawsuit? I, I, I might have heard something yeah. about them. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> are right. they you new or they have to been, been with us for ages? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, that's all I have. Any other questions for me? No, Mark's about mine. <laughs> yeah, she was going to say. Bob's a three ass. <laughs> All right, any other final thoughts, Dr. Barry? No final thoughts for me. That ends my report, President Breland. Thank you, Madam Kennedy. At this time, we'll move to Ms. Four with the finance agenda. I'm sorry, I put that on. Uh, my committee members are present, and you all received all the attachments. 
Uh, Mr. Sean doesn't have anything to report for us this evening. Everything is put in place and now with the district uh, is close of the year. I'm sure coming back for school year, we will have more finances to report, but there's nothing pertinent for tonight moving forward. Any questions, anybody? These are items we will vote on, of course, next Wednesday at board meeting. Any questions? Dr. Barry? No, no ma'am. Okay, that's my report, President. Thank you, Madam Moore. We'll move to our general policies agenda, Mr. Thompson. Thank you. Uh, all board members are present, and I'm gonna pass this right over to Dr. Barry. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Thompson. <laughs> Okay. Not too many today. Not as many as last month. Policy 801.1. I think that's where we're starting. Oh, no, 802. Eight, no, 810.2 is the first one. I'm sorry? I don't have 203 as my first one. Don't have any of those. You don't have that? Nope. She's looking at something I'm looking at um notes, but but they still should be the same policies. They should be. They're not. <laughs> they're not. Oh, they're in a different order. I don't know why two hundred would be after eight hundred, but that's okay. Okay. <laughs> Policy 203, immunization and um, communicable diseases. Those revisions happen um, as a result of the expanded regulation provided by the PA Department of Health to include guidance from the state and the local health officials regarding immunization and communicable diseases. So um, the actions that shall be taken in responding to a student with a communicable disease have also been added to that. That's new language. Policy 209, there's changes to this policy um, about more specific language about health examinations, screenings, and guidelines. And there's a new section of the policy including regulations regarding monitoring student health and maintaining student health records. Policy 209.2, .2, this is the diabetes management policy. It's a new policy. It reflects requirements of many state and federal laws and regulations regarding school health personnel interacting with students with diabetes. And you know why? Because we have so many more students that are being diagnosed that they, they put in a separate policy. Um, policy 210 point, I'm sorry. I just have a quick question about the, yes. the new diabetic policy. Mm -hmm. um, under the section that's, that's called train diabetes personnel, who is the other designee um, other than? So there will be yet? there will be several. So both nurses will be trained quite naturally. And then whoever the teachers are that are associated with the child that has the diabetes, yeah, they will I'm also be trained. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then the health and wellness team that is coming will be training people in there as well. So we'll have quite a few people that will be trained. Let me ask a question on that. Yes. Um, the diabetes part. So after a child is uh, diagnosed with diabetes, whether it's one or two or whatever, then are, we, are they then referred to a family doctor or whoever. Well, generally, with the family treatment. doctor will diagnose them and then they come to us. It's pretty rare that we diagnose okay, it. So then we. And the parents will either bring. Yeah. With and them. if the parent. And I, what I've seen previously now, it's been a while since I've been in a school, like as a principal, but yeah. when I was a principal, they would send orders over to the nurse, mm -hmm. but they they left the responsibility to the parent to come in and tell the nurse. Mm -hmm. But just in case they didn't, they sent yeah. the orders to the nurse. Yeah. So it was a two way communication. Because yeah. uh, a child uh, who has one mm -hmm. who's on insulin mm -hmm. and have to give yeah, themselves some a of shot them have the pump before uh, mm -hmm. all meals, that has to come whatever, to the nurse. All of that. The kid that is not allowed to, to give the themselves yeah. the pump. They've got to be a the diabetic nurse. myself. I know about all of this. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, we do have quite a few kids throughout the district wow. with pumps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. So the policy was much needed. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Where are we now? To 10.1 possession and self administration of asthma inhalers, um, epinephrine and auto injectors. Um, the, po the existing policy is 210.1 possess possession of self administration of asthma inhalers. Mm -hmm. They've added the epinephrine and aut automatic um, injectors. It's been expanded to include that because of the responsibilities and guidelines that have been added, as well as the regulations for student self administration of. Um, epinephrine auto injectors um, the regulations regarding training of the staff and storage of and disposal of the epinephrine auto auto inhalers are also added so the epinephrine does expire so you can't go your entire elementary career with the same epinephrine pen right right mr Ronda? so they have to they have to get a new one every so often and i think that's something that wasn't they they weren't it wasn't in a policy because I had the same one the whole way through. I did. I did. When I was, I had the same one. I do have a question. Mm -hmm. Will the nurses make sure that the students who are self-administering be trained? Because I know there that. won't be any kids self-administering epinephrine. They no, have no, not to, to epinephrine, yeah. but the inhaler. I have seen kids. They're not allowed. Too. They're not okay. allowed to have the inhalers. If we catch them, we send them to the office. I no, mean, to I the mean, nurse's office. I mean, in the nurse's office. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the nurses do train. They do okay. train. That's what I'm making sure. And they're supposed to be getting trained by their healthcare physician as well. They are. But the nurses are definitely training kids on using asthma okay. pumps. I happened to be in a, a school one day, and the kid was pumping it, and then all the medicine was coming out of his mouth. I was like, no, you, you, you it's got to go in. <laughs> I, I knew how to explain it, but I couldn't get him to. And so she was like, no, you need to breathe in, hold your breath, and yeah. Our nurses are great about that. Yeah. And then some of them don't know the difference between a preventative medicine and the other medicine. So that the nurses are doing a lot of education on that. They are. And to piggyback on that too, my pudge has asthma really bad. And I had to get with his mother. See that he gets a pump in school. You can't have them calling me for me to run a pump up there to that school. He needs to have one there in school as well as home because he yeah he suffers with asthma he does. but he is doing better yeah and they need to know that that they have medications there at that nurse's office they do they have them okay policy 331 is that where we are yep all right more specific um job related expenses more spe specific requirements for reimbursement for job related expenses have been added to this policy um, 331 is recommended for liable liability purposes. What do they consider as job related expenses? An example. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. well, what is that example of a job related expense? A job related expense. If you are traveling and you incur, you incur parking and, um, you are traveling for the district for a conference and you park somewhere in a lot and you have to pay for parking. That's a job related expense. Or if you are doing some sort of program in your school class committee and it requires um, materials that have been pre approved um, and the the principal, the principal authorizes you to get those materials. It's a job related expense. So in other words, if an employee is parking somewhere and they're saying where they have to pay for that parking. But that would be like for a conference, not if you come to the central admin building and you pay for parking, that's on you. Like you need yeah. to find somewhere else to park or go to a home. conference or something. Mm -hmm. Aren't they paid for mileage or anything? Or is they are paid for mileage, but if they so park, this is going to be something separate. Huh? Well, they we've always paid for like if 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 I go to if they, I go they, to well, Harrisburg, they, they get paid for mileage, right? And now so if I t if I take my car, if, if I take my car to PDE, yeah, you know, yeah. and I park in the PDE lot, yeah. they charge me, and I do have the right to submit that receipt 
as a job related expense for I never do, but I do. I can't. I mean, but even though you are paid for mileage, or that's yeah, that's, that's but parking is separate. Yeah. Parking is separate mm -hmm. than mileage. It's a separate charge. It's a separate charge. Yeah, like if you go if you go somewhere in Harrisburg and you park in one of those big lots, or oh, oh, they're gonna hit you up. Does that apply to us? <laughs> if you are, if you're at a conference and. If you're on a conference, yeah. That's what I'm, I'm asking, Jeff. Yeah. That applies to us, yeah. right? Not to you all. Okay. Absolutely. What do you say, Jeff? Okay. That's right, because, yeah. Yeah, okay. and if you, if you look in the policy, yeah. there's guidelines right here in the policy. Yeah. Yeah. It outlines the guidelines. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's, that okay, was my policy 918. Yeah. Oopsie, forgot 810. Sorry. School bus, school bus drivers, and school commercial motor vehicle drivers. The policy was originally adopted in 2005 and has not been revised since that date. Act 131 of 2020 revised the vehicle code with provisions for 75 PA CSA section 1609 on requirements for commercial driver's license and um, 1604 on notification requirements for drivers. The new policy um, has been revised to reflect those changes. Commercial motor vehicles are larger vehicles that exceed a weight of 26,001 pounds and are designed to transport more than 16 passengers. Changes to this policy include an expanded definition section, more specificity for safety of drivers and student, including drug and alcohol testing, pre-employment background checks, expectations for drivers, conduct, and consequences for violating these regulations. 810.2 transportation video audio recording you see that video and audio <laughs> so we we had video but no audio now we're we're, we're, we're uptown now <laughs> so it's a new policy designed to provide the board with a structure to regulate the use of video audio recordings on school buses for disciplinary purposes so you can not only see what's going on you can also hear what's going on Eight ten point three school vehicle drivers. This policy focused on um, school vehicle drivers and has also been revised to reflect the changes found in Act 131 of 2020 that revised the vehicle code for provisions 1606 on requirements for commercial driver's license on notification requirements for drivers. School vehicle drivers refers to drivers who operate a motor vehicle designed to carry no more than 10 passengers. This policy offers very similar guidelines as 810.1 with the um, commercial referring to the above. It is recommended for legal liability purposes. And I think the last one is 918, right? Title I Parent and Family Engagement. This policy was revised because of a recommendation from Title I Audit Team, PSBA, drafted, dated 2-18-2018, um, was used to revise this policy. The policy has been revised to adhere to the Title I regard, um, re requirements regarding parent involvement and parent engagement. The revisions include an extended list of district responsibilities to enhance communication and from parents and guardians, including annual meetings, opportunities to provide input to the development of the Title I program and building greater capacity of this all schools and planning and implementing an effective parent engagement model for the Title I parents and guardians. Policy 918 is mandated to adhere to Title I federal guidelines regarding parent engagement. 
May yes. I answer any questions? Yes. In regards to that policy, it's not added as one of our attachments on our agenda. Okay. I can follow I along. Them, yeah, I guess it's not. I just discussed not there. Well, there's a few it. of them, so we yeah. might have missed. That's okay. I just, <laughs> yeah. just make, sure, make sure we just add that. So we'll get it there. We'll it. Get Thank it you. There. Can I ask, answer any other questions about policies? Mr. Breland, that concludes my report. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Thompson, we'll get it. We'll, we'll figure that concludes out. my report. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I apologize. <laughs> um, anyone have any other questions? All right. That wraps it up. Thank you, Mr. Thompson. I believe this is the part where we go into executive session for personnel and legal matters.